talking about different pseudo science seminars that we have the rest of this semester, those that we have next semester as well. We also have these nice books that you can look at. Talks about each of the speakers and gives you some background information. They'll do when they'll be held and so forth. If you have plenty of these, feel free to take them with you as you leave. Today we are uh, we have the pleasure of hearing from David Mercier. He's going to talk to us on the topic of integrative medicine. And uh, I had the pleasure of getting to read his book, A Beautiful Medicine, about a year ago. Some of the masters in biomedicine faculty, we read uh, the book, and it generated some really great discussion on the topic of integrative medicine and, and really had us thinking about uh, different topics in, in a new way. And so it's actually a, a great story that he tells in his book. Uh, if you're interested in it, I would definitely recommend it. But he has, uh, he has quite a, uh, an interesting past. He was a Buddhist monk in Sri Lanka back in the 70s. And so he'll share some of his journey with you today in regards to how, how he got where he is today. But I'll share a little bit of his background, a little more than that. David Mercier is the author of A Beautiful Medicine, A Radical Look at the Essence of Health and Healing, a grand prize winner in the 2013 Nautilus Book Awards. He has a BS in psychology from James Madison University just down the street a master's from the Maryland University of Integrative Health, and an MS in organization development from Case Western Reserve University. He established and then directed a hospital owned integrative, in owned integrative medicine center from 2000 to 2009. David currently works in a private practice as a seminar leader and an acupuncturist. Uh, and just to give you a heads up, if this is your first seminar that you've been to, we'll first hear from Mr. Mercier, and then there will be a, a period of question and answers at the end. So if you have any questions, please save those for the end, and feel free to ask. I'm sure he'll be happy to expand on anything. So with that, Mr. Mercier. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Miller and Har Harvard, is it? Halterman. Halterman yeah. for a very, very warm welcome. And it's very nice to be here and to um, see how dedicated you are, uh, such that you would come out at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. This is my second time at EMU. My first time was around 1969 when I bought a guitar from a student here. And uh, it was a 1952 Fender Telecaster. Are there any guitar players in here? People know that it is now extremely rare and wonderful prized guitar, which I don't have any. So. Well, thank you. I would like to talk about integrative medicine, sometimes called alternative medicine, sometimes holistic, sometimes complementary medicine. The word integrated is used more and more nowadays because the idea is that we want to blend the alternative therapies with conventional practice. So that's gaining the most um, popularity in recent times. And one of the ideas in alternative or holistic therapies, oh, excuse me one second, wasn't I supposed to be recorded for the um, recording? I think you want to do that. Oh, you want to one of the common misperceptions about integrative medicine is that it is the substituting of natural therapies for medications and surgery. So we would think, you know, instead of taking an antidepressant, we might give your St. John's one. Or instead of uh, an anti-inflammatory, we would give uh, you know, willow bark or, or something of that nature. Well, that's actually not the that doesn't reflect the depth and the breadth and some nuances in the field of integrative medicine. And so that's what I would like to talk about today. I'm going to speak mostly about the concepts and perspectives, the, the different ways of looking at health and healing in medicine, which I believe to be the heart and soul of integrative medicine. So that idea is reflected in this quote from Buckminster Fuller. He said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model possible. So the, the concepts and the principles of integrative medicine 
are radically different from those governing the practice of conventional medicine. Sometimes they conflict. Most of the time, the two camps are very, very compatible. They can, be, they can, they can almost always be used together. So before I go in, into um, these ideas, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my, myself. And um, as I mentioned, I did go to Madison College, actually, if that's what it was called back in the family. And I was in the first group of men to come to the, uh, the college. And I studied psychology, but really what I was most passionate about was rock and roll. <laughs> so this is how we looked back in, in the 60s and early 70s. And um, you know, at the time, it was the, it was um, it was kind of a lifeline for me because I really struggled in my undergraduate years. I had very low self confidence and low self esteem and doubt and depression. And when the band would really sync together and create this, this great musical energy, it was, these were ecstatic moments. And so my main interest, I consider rock and roll my uh, my major. So at that time, I decided I wanted to do a lot of it, so that's when I went to Sri Lanka and became a Buddhist monk. But unfortunately, I became very, very sick. I had two kinds of worms, I had all kinds of intestinal problems, crushing, unremitting headache, um, severe depression, I even got to the point of being suicidal. And after two and a half years, I realized I had to come back home, otherwise I would not survive. So when I came back, the uh, medications got rid of the parasites, but I was still feeling terrible. And so that's when I began to explore alternative therapies. And I tried everything under the sun. Chiropractic, massage, acupuncture, um, a lot of psychotherapy, and so on. So I spent a lot of time rebuilding myself up from the ashes. And it took a long time, but in the process, I learned quite a lot about the various modalities that are out there. And I studied acupuncture. And the interesting thing about uh, my getting into acupuncture as a result of my own needs is that in the field of integrative medicine, most people get into these professions out of a personal experience, um, <coughs> profound healing experience or, or a positive experience in some way or another. And um, that's very different from when people uh, go into the field of, of medicine, you know, to, um, becoming doctors and nurses. There's no seven-year-old that's walking around thinking, you know, I want to be an actor when I grow up. It's just not part of the cultural lexicon. But it is, you know, to, to, to want to be a doctor or a nurse. So the difference is that every, virtually everyone that gets into an alternative therapy has benefited from it, and that's how they work. So let's begin with some of the, the key principles and, and the, the perspectives that I think are so one of the first is that the mind and the body are a seamless whole. There is an abundance of research on this. We printed off all the research that supports the idea that the mind affects the body and vice versa. It would fill up this room easily. <coughs> it's actually pretty close to being an incontrovertible fact. It just hasn't made its way into mainstream. Science is there very, very solid. So one person that you might be interested in reading is Candace Perk, who died just the first year. At the age of 27, uh, working, at, I believe, at Johns Hopkins, she discovered the network of opioid receptors. And if I say opioid receptors, is everyone familiar with that? OK, in case someone it is, a receptor is, is a, a dock, sort of like a, a boat dock on a cell. And for a molecule to exert its effect on the cell, it has to go into the dock just like a boat that go into the dock. So she found that there are these receptors all over the body which receive neuropeptides or the, the neurochemicals that are behind the experience of our movements. So there's serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins, and so on. And, and these are not located just in the brain, but everywhere throughout the body. 
since they're located everywhere in the body, she hypothesized that that we feel emotions with our bodies, not just as some abstract experience or something that happens just in the brain, but it happens everywhere in the body. So for example, 90% of the receptors for serotonin, the, the chemical that, that uh, most antidepressants are trying to increase by quantity in the brain, 90% of those receptors are in the intestine. So that's a very, very surprising kind of, of uh, discovery. But she said that it is actually incorrect to simply speak about the body. To be complete and accurate, we can only speak about the body-mind. We cannot understand biology without taking into account the mechanisms of consciousness itself. They are inseparable. we have the, the placebo effect. And, and interestingly enough, um, well, again, I, I'm not sure what you know and don't know, so I'll just explain briefly. Placebo is um, the, the mechanism by which a person who takes a pill thinking it's a medication will get better even if it's not a medication. So the placebo is used in research to weed out the real effects of a medication versus the power of suggestion so this is used in, in virtually all studies of, of medications. Now if we think about it, if we, if we recognize the phenomenon that many people will get better just thinking that they're taking a medication, this is an astounding fact. We should be falling out, out of our chair. Think of the power of the mind, that kind of, of an effect can reduce pain, it can reduce anxiety, it can reduce you know, a, a variety of symptoms and diseases. Simply through the power of belief, this is really astonishing. But what, what the problem is in, in, the, in the usual way we look at placebo is that it's used simply as a one tool in the, in the context of research to weed out what they consider to be in medication. In a very interesting study that came out recently from Harvard, they took a number of subjects and they gave them a pill and said, this is a placebo pill. This is an inert substance. There's nothing in here medicinal. <coughs> Sometimes when people take placebo, placebo pills, they get better anyway. Gave the subjects the placebo pill, and about 30% of them got better. Knowing that it was a placebo pill, this is really, really extraordinary. And we could go on and on. I'll just tell you about one other um, study about the power of mind. They were doing a functional MRI, which is a, a, an MRI of the brain in real time, while they administered electric shocks to the finger of, of their subjects. And so they administered the shocks and measured what happened to the brain and a certain part of the brain associated with pain of the finger lit up. And so this is pretty consistent. Then they took another group of people and said, we're going to administer an electric shock. Before we do, we're going to put some lidocaine on your finger so you won't feel it. Except that it was just skin lich. So it had no analgesic effect. They administered the electric shock. There was no activity. That's how powerful it is. So in integrative medicine, we really emphasize that. We really um, focus on people understanding what their emotions are, uh, trying to resolve them, and seeing that there might be a connection between their emotional stresses and their physical symptoms. There's a doctor named John Sarno, S-A-R-N-O, who's written a number of very interesting books. One of them is called Mind Body Prescription. He was a doctor in New York who uh, saw a lot of patients with back and he had an amazing cure rate. His theory that up to 80 to 90% of back pains are stress induced. So all he could do was have people get in touch with their emotions, express them, and 
see what happens. Huge numbers of, of them would have their pains go away right away. For others, it took weeks and months. But he had an extraordinary cure rate, and he had a waiting list of two or three months. So blind body prescription is a, a real eye opener. Hypnosis, guided imagery, and hypnosis. They gave, um, they hypnotized a group of Japanese schoolchildren and put um, some poison ivy, um, rubbed poison ivy on one of their arms and told them they were blindfolded. That this was um, made worse, some things like that. And um, they didn't break out the poison ivy. And then with another group, they, they, um, they told them that this was poison ivy. It actually rubbed a maple leaf on them and it broke out in a So hypnosis is, is a state in which we, we reach into the unconscious layers of the mind where there's greater suggestibility. And that in that state of suggestibility, extraordinary things can happen. Or the good of the bad. <coughs> and it's well known that stress increases the risk of disease. It increases the risk of cancer. Heart disease, heart attacks, increases the risk of diabetes, um, Alzheimer's, a huge variety of diseases. And it's estimated that up to 90% of illnesses are stress related. And even if it were only half of that, it would still be an extraordinary effect. So as we look at the mind body connection, I think sometimes we can learn better from the language of the arts. Um, I think we have the language of science obviously very important. The language of the arts can be very important as well. So with regards to the mind-body connection, I have two that I'd like to share with you. One is from a dancer named Isadora Duncan, who danced back in the 20s and the 30s. And she said, a dancer's body is the luminous manifestation of the soul. A dancer's body is the luminous manifestation of the soul. And the singer Judy Garland wrote, it was not into my ear, she whispered, but my heart. It was not my lips, she kissed, but my soul. So what she was saying, what they were both saying, is that there is something beneath the veneer of our material existence, which of course is very consistent with many, many spiritual traditions. But there is something more than what we see in the body, which in fact is the essence of who we are and what we are. So if the Greek philosopher Plato had been looking over Judy Garland's shoulder while she was writing that, he would have said, you go, girl, that's exactly what I'm saying. Holism. Holism is roughly put, uh, the idea that everything's connected to everything. So in an integrative approach, we try to see how all the different parts of the body and all the different components of a person's life might be related. So we're always looking at the context of the person's life, the context of the symptom. <coughs> so for that reason, we focus on treating the whole person. Now that's kind of vague, and what that means is that what we want clinically is for the patient to start feeling better overall not just about eliminating the symptom. So if a person comes in and says, you know, my back hurts, my shoulder hurts, we certainly want that to improve. But in addition to that, we want them to feel more vitality, more a sense of relaxation. Um, we want them to feel better emotionally. We want them to be more productive, and so on and so on. It's not just about the symptom. And so what a lot of patients report in getting integrated type of treatments is, Something like, you know, I kind of feel better overall. It's hard to describe, but I feel better. And they just have this indefinable sense that sometimes <coughs> the quality of their being is better. That's very important because in an integrative approach, that sense of well-being, that subjective experience of feeling good, is foundational to the healing of particular parts of the body. So one way of describing that is that we treat the terrain and not the disease. So if I get a patient who has cancer, there's nothing I do for the cancer, which you know, would be unethical to even claim to do that. But we can treat the terrain. We can treat everything else in the body. We can treat the way the body is functioning overall. To be a little more specific about that, 
we might say that what we're trying to do is improve overall cellular vitality. So if, if the cell is missing adequate amounts of vitamin D or folic acid or zinc, well, it doesn't make any difference what the disease is. The cell needs those substances. So for a nutritionist, who could do a, a, a blood chemistry analysis, they would figure out what the cells need and just supply it. And it is irrelevant, for the most part, what the symptoms of the disease are. And that's a very, very important piece because in many, many situations, simply treating the terrain is enough for the particular symptoms. social dimensions of the person's life, the emotional lifestyle, you know, is the person working too much, uh, how are things at work, and so on and so on. And those are the contexts for health and for, for disease. <coughs> Exercise, sleep, rest, and nutrition. Sometimes just taking care of a person's lifestyle at this level is enough to make sense. Actually, I would say the key strategy, as I see it, in integrative medicine is to do this, to activate the extraordinary and the endogenous healing potential in the mind and body. So for many of our therapies, such as acupuncture or manipulative therapy, which I'll talk about in a minute, we're not adding anything to the body. We're not giving medications. We're not substituting anything. For example, an anti-inflammatory medication is often a substitute for the anti-inflammatory mechanisms that already exist in the body. But we're not substituting it. We're simply encouraging the activation of cellular potential, the overall body's ability to organize itself, to recalibrate itself, to heal itself. And that's the main thing that we are looking at. We're not disease oriented for that reason. Overall cellular vitality. And this is a fascinating book that, that I would highly recommend. It's called Radical Remission by Kelly Turner. And I just read it recently, it just came out. And Dr. Turner heard about some people who had actually gotten cured from stage three and stage four cancers without chemotherapy. Radiation. She began to do research in this area, and she found 1,000 documented cases of people with cancers at all stages, and many of them were stage three, stage four, stage four, except for terminal, who got rid of the cancer or had the tumors reduced to their original small size and, and, and had the tumor become inert, inactive. Now, if you think about it, this is really extraordinary. We should be falling out of our chairs with, with that. To have a stage four brain cancer, stage four colon cancer, stage four pancreatic cancer disappear entirely. And this is all documented with PET scans and x-rays and so on before and after. is really extraordinary. So this actually, this book can change your life. I certainly hope you read my book. This book, Radical Remission will give you the understanding that any of us can heal virtually anything. Whatever condition we might have, um, most of you are very young, so I'm sure you're very healthy, um, but whatever condition we have is likely to be healed by the extraordinary and endogenous healing potential that already exists. So this is a, a key point in integrative medicine. We trust that the body is the miracle trust that the body can do truly <coughs> extraordinary things. The question is, how do we activate that? And the answers lie in what we do day to day um, in, in our life. Now what Dr. Turner found actually surprised her. She tried to find what the common denominators were. She found nine factors that seem to be common to all of these cases. She interviewed a hundred of them. And one of them was uh, diet, herbs, a radical change in diet is a very healthy thing. Another was herbs and supplements. But the other seven were all psychological and spiritual. These people found a greater purpose and meaning.
mother, both she was age six when she came to see me. And she had stage four lung cancer that had metastasized to her hips, her lungs, and her, excuse me, her, her liver and her ribs. And she said, David, what do I do? And I said, what I say to all my cancer patients, which is pull out all the stuff, do everything, get massage, uh, eat well, uh, exercise, get some acupuncture, but mostly, work through the emotional stress she was feeling around her son. Son was 55, drunk, homeless, and broke. So she did that. This was June of 2008. And she got a little bit of chemotherapy because she couldn't tolerate it, so she didn't get very much help. And by midsummer, she had come to peace with the fact that she might die. And she had forgiven her son and come to peace with the fact that she had no control over in October 2008, she went to see her oncologist, which was down the street, and the cancer was gone. All that was left was a tumor about two centimeters uh, in one of her lungs, and it was in her. It was just insane. So this is truly mind-boggling. This is considered impossible. So if in any field of study there's one anomaly that disturbs the prevailing standards about what's possible, it's imperative to pay close attention to it. So in this case with Dr. Turner, there are a thousand documented cases of late stage cancers going into this. So this is truly amazing, and I hope you enjoy it. Another very important idea is that symptoms are dangerous. So rather than trying as hard and as quickly as we can to try to get rid of a symptom, whether it's a headache, or back pain, or a bowel problem. The more important question we ask is, what is it that we are supposed to learn? What is the symptom trying to teach us? So if we think about the existence of pain and discomfort, we might want to ask, why after two and a half million years of evolution, didn't the dynamics of evolution weed out this horrible thing called pain and discomfort? Why is it still there? We've evolved quite a lot, but we still have pain. Well, obviously, <coughs> pain has enormous survival value. Pain is what alerts us to what's not good for us, what's not healthy for us. And a great and simple example of that is if our hands hurt when it gets near a fire, pain is not a problem. And I'll say that again. When our hand gets close to a fire and it hurts, not a problem. It's a message. It's a symptom. It's an encouragement to do something different because you are approaching danger. So one of the things I recommend to my patients is something that, that may sound a little strange, and they certainly think it's strange, but I think they get it eventually, and that is to thank the symptoms because it's their sole purpose of helping us out, guiding us further along, on the road to health and wellness. And in particular, something that needs to be changed in our lives, whether it's just you know, needing more potassium and zinc, or we need to stop drinking so much, or something of that nature, is all happening because it's trying to help us. So our symptoms are friends, they're teachers, they're coaches, they're guides. They are our allies. And so the best thing to do when, when our allies are trying to help us is to go, Okay, I'm going to listen to that, I'm, and I'm going to do some detective work here in the terrain, in the context of my whole life, and try to figure out what is going on. Is there something in my diet, in my lifestyle, in my emotional life that needs some kind of correction? Now, obviously, if we can't figure it out, seeing a doctor is very important, but a lot of times the answers are right there in our, in our lifestyle. slightly more philosophical point of view, is you look at the role of suffering in our lives. The suffering is, is really part of it. And what, what happens, I think, as we become more and more accustomed to our, our technologies and our pharmacological approaches to healing, we want the quick fix. And we, we start experiencing a, a reduced tolerance but if, on the contrary, 
have an entirely different philosophy about what to do with our aches, our pains, our discomfort, fatigue, and even our disease. There are many patients with whom I've had discussions about this where we, they recognize that they got the disease because, quote unquote, Mother Nature was unhappy with their lifestyle. Mother Nature, again, quote unquote, would send them symptoms such as fatigue or aches and pains to try to slow them down. And when they wouldn't slow down, she thought, you know, I need to send a stronger message. And this keeps building and building until finally some kind of disease comes about. And they have to get into the battery. They have to take time off. They have to take their drugs. And so it, it's all a very intelligent and intelligible pattern. And so recognizing her pain, suffering, and symptoms are here to help us. We can do a complete about face as compared to the way we usually work. Another very important part of integrated medicine is the relationship with the center of care. We strongly emphasize the connection between the patient and the practitioner. And in many schools, some acupuncture schools, naturopathic schools, and so on, there are huge amounts of time spent on learning how to listen, how to connect, how to relate, how to nurture the patients that, that we're seeing. We learn how to touch, how to touch sensitively how to use touch as communication. You learn to be non-judgmental and to be able to allow the person free reign to express everything they need to express <coughs> as part of their healing journey. So the relationship is key. And some of my teachers in, in school often said, unless that relationship is in place, you're not going to do good work. And patient participation is strongly encouraged. In light of everything that I just talked about, it makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? That if the reason why their symptoms um, are occurring, uh, the, the reasons are in their lifestyle, in the terrain, then a lot of the work is up to them. And we can patch up their symptoms, but if the symptom is simply an indication, a message that something is amiss in their lifestyle, patching up the symptom is bordering on malpractice. Because if we're not getting to the root of the symptom, then we're not doing the patient a favor. In addictions treatment, and I know there's a talk uh, a few weeks ago about addictions and crazy. In addictions treatment, there is something called enabling, which is acting in a loving way toward the addict in our lives that paradoxically perpetuates the addiction. By being nice, by not setting our boundaries, we support people in continuing on the path of self-destruction. So enabling happens in the practice of any kind of medicine. It happens in integrative medicine, it happens in conventional medicine. Unless we encourage the patient to take full responsibility for their lives, if that's where the problem lies. So these are two very crucial ideas. The relationship is key in the healing relationship, and patient participation is So I entitled the talk to flourish because this is, again, one of the uh, ways in which we delineate the integrated approach. It is not just about fixing symptoms. It is not about having a patient disease-free. It is not about just preventing them. What we want, ideally, is for a human being to reach the maximum of their potential psychologically, physically, spiritually, um, socially, professionally, in every way possible. It is not about the repair model. It is not about fixing what's broken. Now, interestingly enough, if we do work to treat the terrain, the whole context of a person's life and body, what happens is it dramatically increases, as I mentioned earlier, the chance of specific diseases will improve uh, along with medications or sometimes on their own. So we really strongly emphasize that. When I get a 60-year-old patient in my practice, 
the idea is that if there is a broader vision for what's possible in our life, that alone has that positive placebo effect. We can have them begin, uh, have them start to think differently and act differently, consistent with the idea that they may live a hundred happy, healthy years. So flourishing, becoming the best we can be in all ways is one of the goals of And of course, if we do that, we develop the greatest possible resistance to disease. And so if we look at what does it mean to flourish, to feel our very best, well, it's obviously not just a physical condition. To feel our best and really be flourishing, we have to have a certain amount of happiness and uh, self-respect and self-esteem and self-confidence and uh, strong social network. And as we think about developing those parts of ourselves, it's really interesting that there are parallels to what our spiritual practices, the first spiritual traditions teach us. As we look at the research into the mind-body connection, um, and Candace Pert actually developed a field of what's called psychoneuroimmunology. Did you already mention it? Maybe I did. But she developed psychoneuroimmunology, and there's actually a field called neurocardiology, which came when scientists discovered that there are brain cells in the heart. So we feel, we think with our hearts, literally, there are neurons in, in the heart itself. So anyway, so as we look at, at the mind-body and how much our emotions affect our blood chemistry, there's a very interesting, um, uh, and, and a very interesting thing about that. And what they're discovering is that all those conditions of the, the, the human being, which are related to what our spiritual traditions teach us, such as compassion, love, and forgiveness, are good for our blood chemistry. So love and compassion, forgiveness, uh, kindness, relatedness, and so on, uh, reduce blood pressure, they reduce cortisol levels, the stress hormone, they improve the production of endorphins, and and dopamine, oxytocin, and all of these neuropeptides that have to do with the heal, with the uh, positive healing effect on the body. So that's a fascinating parallel. Everything that we do is positive for ourselves and people. Coincident, and I use the word coincidentally in quote quotation marks. Quote unquote, coincidentally, is good for the human body. And conversely, anger, resentment, irritation. And by the way, I should, I should mention chronic and severe uh, states. You know, we, we can be angry for a day or two, and then you know, we're not going to get sick from that. We can go through difficult times. Um, and the human body is very resilient, so I'm not suggesting that you know, the, the slightest unpleasant emotion is going to cause disease, not by any means. But those, those qualities that are spiritual traditions are trying to encourage us to transcend are actually very harmful to the human body. They raise cortisol levels. They deplete all of the endorphin, the serotonin, the dopamine, the oxygen, and so on. And as I said earlier, they increase the risk of, again, in the long term, of cancer, heart disease, and many, many other diseases. So it's a fascinating, an absolutely fascinating parallel. And here's a chart to um, describe that. So what we're accustomed to is thinking that medicine was about taking people from the smallest social to sense. But in an integrated approach, what we want is to go beyond that to optimal forms of transformation. I want to introduce you to an example of flourishing. Helen Klein is a woman that uh, some organizations on the Eastern Shore of Maryland brought um, to a conference to speak. At the time, she was 84 years old, and she was running a marathon every month. She started running at the age of 55, and, and she, 
old records and the uh, 100 meter dash, the long jump, the distance throw, the javelin throw, and so on. In this picture, she's 94 years old. She started exercising at 77. So I mentioned earlier that the extraordinary endogenous potential of the human mind and body. We're talking about fitness here, but nevertheless, this is truly extraordinary. And any of us are capable of this at, at any age. Now, they didn't do this way watching television. They worked very hard. They worked every day on their fitness. This is what's possible. Chronological aging, obviously, is a one-way road. But biological aging is reversible. It is literally reversible. This man is 62 years old. In his this is what's possible. subject of an Oscar-winning documentary called The Lady in Apartment 6. She was, I think, 106 or 107 during the filming of this um, documentary. She was the happiest person you could possibly imagine. She was full of life, love, and light. She got tremendous joy from playing the piano every single day of her life for about an hour. And in her words, she loved everybody. She forgives everybody, even her captors at Auschwitz when she was a, a child. Now, they didn't say anything about her diet, but I'm guessing she just ate whatever she wanted. And I don't think she ever ate. But in this case, could it have been the power of her happiness, vitality, and enjoyment had a positive So now I'd like to talk about um, some specific therapies. I mean, there's so much that I could say we could go all day um, about this, but I'll just introduce you to um, a few of them, real quick. So how many of you have been to that therapy for this audience? Oh, you're missing out, those of you who haven't done it. It's a wonderful experience. Um, it's very relaxing, and many people feel that they're floating on clouds when they come out of it. So they're available everywhere in hotels, and, rooms, and even in some hospitals. The <coughs> size um, can reduce cortisol by 31 percent, which is pretty significant. And increase serotonin 28 percent, and dopamine 31 percent. So it's a very effective tool. It's great for children. It's great for infants. Uh, and as you may know, touch is essential for children, infants, and children. And that's why. You actually rewire the brain, you create more connections in the brain when you touch them. And you trigger the production of oxytocin, which is a, one of those neuropeptides <coughs> found in technology. <coughs> Nutrition. Nutrition is getting a lot of press these days, and that's wonderful because nutrition has a profound effect on our health. Many, many diseases and many, many symptoms simply come from. SAD, S A D, standard American diet. So the American diet is SAD, is full of processed foods, unhealthy fats, as opposed to the healthy fats. Um, far too much sugar, far too many chemicals, so on and so on. The nutrition is crucial, and we can consider that whole foods are, are actually medicinal. Every time you eat, you're creating a cascade of hormonal events that affect cellular vitality. There's a whole field called nutrigenomics, and it's a study of how foods can affect the expression or non-expression of the genes in our body. Now, it's estimated that about 70% of the genes in our body can be turned on and off. And this is related to a field called epigenetics. And what they have found, and this is starting around 1995, was that there is a little switch on top of these genes, and you can turn them off and turn them off. Now, this is really an extraordinary finding because you know it has been normally thought that we are destined. You know, we inherited certain genes from our parents, and 
you might guess, whole foods, healthy foods, turn off the unhealthy genes and activate them. There are a lot of different theories of nutrition, and people are very passionate and automatic and almost evangelical about their approach to the design. And many of them are in direct conflict with each other. But what I've noticed is in the last five to seven years, there's an interesting convergence of theories. And there's more and more research, and there's more and more research that's coming out supporting the idea that a low carbohydrate diet is what's so the consumption of sugar, but bread is sugar, pasta is sugar, cereals and grains are sugar, of course fruits are sugar. Uh, the excess of carbohydrate intake leads to inflammation. And so eating a whole foods diet with healthy fats, healthy protein, but limited high density <coughs> carbs, bread, rice, pasta, bread. So desserts is considered to be a very important principle in nutrition. And if you're interested, there are three groups of, of practitioners. You might see a naturopath is someone who has studied essentially nothing but um, holistic therapies, using food and various other alternative therapies. Their training, by the way, is very similar. They get as much anatomy, physiology, and molecular biology, and so on, as people do in medical school. It's just that they use only natural. And there's one in, in Stanford. Uh, there's licensed nutritionists and dietitians. And a functional medicine doctor. Functional medicine is the word for the, the field, the specialty um, for doctors, where they can study nutritional therapy, how to use supplements, and how to use dietary therapy, and so on. So if you're interested in that, there is an Institute of Functional Medicine online. Manipulative therapies, these are hands-on therapies. Um, osteopathic manipulation is, is really the manipulation of the spine and the joints with the hands. An osteopath is a doctor, is a physician, and the vast majority of them will practice conventional medicine, internal medicine, neurology, and so on. But a small percentage of them specialize in manipulation, and that can be very effective. I once had a back pain um, from doing something wrong in the gym. And I could barely get out of bed, I couldn't drive, I could barely um, move. And after seven days, someone drove me to my osteopath in, in Washington, D.C., and I walk out pain free. After seven days, I'm free from that. Chiropractors do something very similar manual therapy and physical therapy, and a, a huge variety of therapies, for all being myofascial release and so on. And they can be very, very helpful. Energy medicine, and this is kind of interesting, this is simply laying on of hands on a patient and um, helping the patient feel relaxed, helping the patient feel that someone is there connected to them and is aware and supportive and nurturing. Uh, so Reiki is one, hands of light, healing touch, and uh, Reiki is actually probably the most popular one. You can learn it in a day or a weekend, and it can be very effective. Get Reiki are often completely relaxed and painful off we do so it will go away. When I worked for a hospital for nine years, we conducted a study, and um, this is an unpublished study. We, we had a group of volunteers going around in the evenings and finding patients who were uh, uncomfortable and asking if they wanted to break. And so they would lay hands on, and sometimes, and this may sound a little spooky, sometimes they wouldn't even touch. It's just the, the energy, as we call it, or the heat from the hands above the patient's body was enough to create a, a effect. But with 88 patients, we found that the mean reduction in pain is uh, 2.31. And the VAS is the visual analog scale. So it's simply asking the patient on a scale of 1 to 10, and being the worst, how bad it should be. So we had a mean reduction of 2.3. But we would often have patients with pain level of 7 or 8, have the pain go away completely in 15 to 20 minutes. And all our Reiki practitioners were doing were placing their hands. There's a program sequence, but all they're doing is laying their hands gently on the For anxiety, we reduced uh, 2.8, for malaise, 2.9. And these are respectively about 40, 50, to 50 percent reduction. My body medicine, um, 
meditation and relaxation techniques. The most common form of meditation in clinical settings is called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And um, it's actually the kind of mindfulness that I, I studied when I was doing my meditation in California and Sri Lanka. And they've done a lot of research on it, and it can dramatically reduce pain, again, simply through the um, positive manipulation of consciousness. Pain can reduce, depression can reduce. Why the writer makes it easy. Hypnosis, guided imagery. If you look into the eyes of an Olympic um, skater or a skier before they start the race, you'll see their eyes going into full force. This is used a lot in um, athletic performance, but it's also used a lot in um, clinical settings too. There's uh, a woman named Peggy Huddleston who developed a number of CDs. Patients can listen to before surgery, and they found that post-operative pain reduced from simply listening to the last patient's So in one study, they found that these techniques can reduce the risk of all cause mortality in cardiac patients by 41%. If there were a medication that would do it, that would be on the top of the list of standards of care in cardiology, and it would be a block of How are we doing time-wise? It's about 5 o'clock. Yeah. Wrap it up. OK. Um, so, so acupuncture, keep the clock line, and find a lot of information about it. Um, acupuncture produces endorphins, melatonin, can affect gene expression in the latest um, line of research. So just to summarize, the mind and body are seeing this whole, you look at the holism, Activate the extraordinary endogenous potential to be behind the body, simple to teach us, relate to the center of care and patient participation, and we walk here. So, to sum up, what I'd like to do is once again appeal to the language of the arts to encapsulate what this process of healing is, what health and healing efforts are. And so, this is a line from the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. I think this really captures the idea of health and healing. There it says, I want to do to you what springtime does to the cherry tree. So the question to ask ourselves is, are our symptoms trying to teach us how to love, flourish, and become all that we can be? And is it that, this, that there is some sort of evolutionary impulse that's embedded in the cosmos itself that is demanding of us? that we can keep moving toward love, wholeness, and belonging. Thank you.
would depend on who the practitioner was. So John, Dr. John Sarno would go straight ahead to the psychologist. Um, so it depends on, on the individual practitioner's approach, their, their strategy. In my case, I start with the acupuncture first because it can be a little dicey to suggest to some patients that their emotional stresses might be behind their, their pain. Um, we used to have the term, we still have the term psychosomatic medicine, and that's a very pejorative term. When a patient is told it's all in your head, which is the way it's often described, it's very insulting. But what we, what we talk about instead is that this is part of the way that the human mind and body designs, so there's nothing wrong with it. Anyway, I'm getting off track. But um, it, it really depends on the practice. practice. I had a patient uh, recently whose uh, upper back pain and her lower back pain were not improving at the three or four act. So I inquired and I said, is there something else going on in your life? And it turned out she was enraged at her boss. So I suggested that as she was driving home, to yell and scream and cuss and growl and make all kinds of noise, get the emotion down. She called me, emailed me the next day, and she said her pain was 70% reduced, and sometimes they were gone. So my approach, I usually start with the physical, but, um, but always suggest the possibility of the psychological. Interpersonal relationships and community relative to relevant to integrated medicine. They're very relevant. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because you think community is kind of not vague. But there's a profound impact in, in perhaps an indirect way on human blood chemistry um, when things, in, in either case, when things are going well and not going well within our community. So I would think that the, the, the patient's perception of what their community is to them, in other words, if they feel that they live in a community that is unsupported or friendly or hostile, then that belief will trigger a cascade of neurochemicals in the body, which will be deleterious to them. And conversely, if they feel happy and connected and appreciated in their communities, they can have the positive. There are many, many research studies that, that support the idea that being in a community, and especially in a religious or spiritual community, actually increases longevity, increases 